Oh, good afternoon, uh, good evening um, from across the region, from across the, uh, the world. Um, my name is Gemma Van Houdren, it's the Director of the Statistics Division at the United Nations SCAP, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all today to bring you um, our today's cafe on the extremely important topic of um, migrant statistics, um, but actually more broadly, it's not just migrant statistics, it's also other refugee populations, refugees, asylum speakers, seekers, internally displaced persons. Um, we're actually bringing this um, cafe to, to you today as part of our preparations for a midterm assessment of the Asia Pacific decade for civil registration and vital statistics systems in Asia Pacific. And we, you know, all increasingly recognise the importance that um, of good birth registrations, good death registrations, um, and good recording of these life events. Um, particularly during COVID. And it's really important that we make sure we cover all population groups, including the refugee population groups and related groups. So I have the pleasure today of, um, you know, we've reached out and got some excellent speakers for you today. We're going to bring you um, Dalit Gilmez from the Statistics Office of Turkey is going to speak with us and Lev Makar from the Australian Bureau of Statistics in Australia. So we're going all the way from the west, all the way across to the southeast, um, bringing you the experiences of two um, prominent stats officers in our region. And we also have great pleasure to have with us UN um, HCR um, and the UN Death Statistics Division and Regional Advisor uh, with us today. Please, I encourage you to listen to the presentations and, and share your questions in the chat. The cafe has been designed and it's been called a cafe because we wanted to have a conversation series with you, not a, a webinar series. Um, so please what make, make, uh, take advantage of our really great speakers with us today. And I'll hand over to Petra, who's going to moderate the discussion. Petra, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Um, yeah, we're very excited to have this, the first, I think, Stats Cafe, which is going to be focused on refugee uh, statistics. Um, and we'll start with uh, Vivekha uh, Nielsen from uh, UNSD. Vivekha is an interregional advisor, where she's managing several projects linked to SDG monitoring. Um, she covers a wide array of topics, including vital health statistics, statistics and forced displacement, and the use of administrative data, questionnaire design, data analysis, and user engagement. But Vibeka and I have worked together for a long time as uh, on the expert group on refugee and IDP statistics, where she's led a lot of the work there in her previous role in Statistics Norway. And she's done a number of secondments to the joint IDP profiling service in UNHCR through the Norwegian Refugee Council uh, roster, this a link between UNHCR and Statistics Norway. So a wide experience in dealing with um, on refugee statistics. And, and Vibeka will present the work of the expert group in refugee, on refugee and IDP statistics. So over to you, Vibeka. Thank you very much, Petra, and, and thank you also for inviting me to join this uh, Stats Cafe on a topic that, um, yeah, especially I know the two of us have um, had a lot of interest in and, and been very engaged in and uh, still are. Uh, as you said, I will be uh, sharing some of the work that we've done in the expert group on uh, refugee and IDP statistics. I'll just be sharing my screen. Um, sorry. So, um, I'm keeping it quite general today because I think that it's um, there's probably various levels of knowledge around um, this expert group on refugee and IDP statistics. I think you probably know more about the origin, the origin of the um, the expert group uh, Petra than I do because I wasn't there at, entirely at the beginning. But it is back in now three four years ago that it was brought to the statistical commission. Uh, and it was agreed to um, to start an expert group that would focus on on pro providing recommendations on refugees 
uh, and statistics uh, also on internally displaced people. And the rationale for, for doing that was something that also came out of a collaboration between uh, UNHCR, the Joint IDP Profiling Service and, and Statistics Norway, where they saw that although there was quite a lot of uh, statistics being produced on, on forcibly displaced populations and, and especially on refugees, uh, it was very limited when it came to involvement of the um, official statistical community in countries. And that's really why we wanted to bring it forward to the Statistical Commission so that we could provide recommendations um, on how to produce these statistics and, and in that sense also um, aim at involving the, the statistics community more so that there also would be more national ownership to statistics on, on forced displacement both at, uh, or mainly at national level, but, but also um, in, in a wider context, bringing together the, the official statistics and the statistics produced by international and regional agencies um, and kind of having common standards. And of course, a, a key element in that, um, in, in providing these official statistics is to, to increase the evidence-driven policymaking in the area um, and also to increase collaboration. And I think we've been quite successful also on the collaboration. Um, it's been a big group that has been sticking together and working together, uh, working through a lot of different um, challenges. Um, I think something that, that was very um, a big learning curve for myself was to kind of uh, coming more from the statistics community, uh, working with uh, the humanitarian agencies that have a very different uh, work uh, experience and, and kind of focusing on different things. So to kind of find common language and, and work together through this to provide recommendations has been very interesting and, and, um, and yeah, uh, a lot of learning. And then we also, of course, uh, hope to, to have increased comparability of statistics nationally and internationally. I mentioned uh, a lot of uh, different agencies and countries working together. Uh, the EGRIS membership uh, currently has uh, around 45 countries involved. And I think it's somewhere between 20 and 30 international and regional agencies working within the uh, EGRIS umbrella. So uh, we also now um, have an extended steering committee. Uh, originally we were six, seven members. Now we are um, 12, 14 members in the steering committee uh, who actively work on this and, and we also have different task teams with other agencies and countries again who are actively involved. So, so there's a lot of engagement around this and, and um, the countries have really had a say and have been quite active in the context and, and still are. So what are the achievements of the expert group? Um, we now have two sets of recommendations that have been adopted at the Statistical Commission. In 2018, uh, the International Recommendations on Refugee Statistics were adopted. And in March this year, we also had uh, International Recommendations on Internally Displaced Persons Statistics adopted by the Statistical Commission. Um, the both documents are available uh, publicly. The, the IDP one is, um, is still being finalized in its um, kind of more nice looking form, but, but it is all there. In addition, because we know that recommendations can sometimes be quite challenging to, to focus on and to, to understand, there is also uh, a work ongoing to put together a compiler's manual, as we call it, which is a practical implementation tool and is meant to be a living document. So it already has a lot of content, but this will be continuous work in progress. Uh, and we hope to also add more and more country experiences, practical level learnings uh, to this document or this compiler's manual. And then I think a very important achievement is also that we see more and more ownership to this uh, at national level not only from the statistics offices, but also in a, in a wider context, although the, the members of the expert group uh, mainly uh, are from statistical of, of offices. And um, uh, we, we have, two, we have uh, Turkey here who, who will be sharing some of their experience on, on the IDP side. Something that we have been highlighting in other contexts is, is Afghanistan 
who's been working um, uh, to set up a working group uh, with national and international policymakers. Uh, and they're also working to agree on uncommon definitions and aligning their data systems. So, so it's um, uh, just one of, of um, several examples that we are seeing now from countries uh, working to implement the recommendations. Something else that is um, where EGRIS has been quite involved, so we, we still call it an achievement, although it's of course also many other actors in, involved in this, is that they're now uh, with the revision of the SDG indicator framework in, in, uh, in March this year, we now have an indicator on refugees in the SDG framework. So 1074 is the proportion of the population who are refugees by country of origin, and UNHCR is serving as the custodian agency. I, I think this has kind of gotten a bit lost. It's it's not been that visible, the revision of the SDG framework, but it, I think it's a, it's a good addition to now have the, uh, the refugees also specifically involved or, or specified uh, as an indicator in the framework. And in addition, um, the expert group has been recommending uh, which priority indicator should be disaggregated by forced displacement. And I've also provided the links to the documents for those who are interested and, and we can, I'm sure you will share the presentations afterwards. After having adopted the two documents at the Statistics Commission, um, we now uh, have moved to what we call phase three of the expert group, which will be focusing more specifically on implementation and capacity development. Uh, there's three task teams that have been developed. One is focusing on, on finalizing and, and disseminating and promoting the recommendations and, and the manual. So it's kind of the outreach, um, the advocacy work. The second one is uh, focusing on strengthening capacity. Um, so, so basically capacity development. And then the third one is focusing on, on providing technical support and is also kind of more specifically linked to further developing the um, the compiler's manual. And through that, we also want to, of course, capture the lessons learned, bring in the peer-to-peer uh, -peer experience, learning from each other, etc. And uh, yeah, continue the, the ref refinement of the manual uh, and compilation of, of uh, the statistics. Yeah, so here is just a picture from uh, when we were in, uh, in Turkey, uh, had an expert uh, group meeting there. As you see, it's a strong community of experts um, and, and we're all really working to try and make uh, vulnerable, vulnerable groups more visible and, and provide reliable data to decision makers on these groups. Um, yeah, and you've been seeing probably this um, type of logo that we have for EGRIS. It's just something I put together because there are so many agencies and, and countries now involved that it's difficult to, to put up all the logos. But um, I, I think we might be getting a more official logo moving forward at some point later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivekha, for that, that presentation and for the excellent work of the, of the expert group. Um, I'd like to now move on to uh, invite. Sorry, can we just need people to mute themselves, please? Thank you. Um, we'd like to invite um, Lev, Dr. Lev Mikhaev of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. He's a data engineer in the National Migrant Statistics Unit in the ABS. He's worked extensively in the fields of data linkage for migrant population and advises on the use of in indicators pertaining to cultural and language diversity in the Australian context. Lev has also worked with stakeholders across all levels of government, national and international, and the private sector to deliver statistical solutions to meet information and policy needs. So we're very happy to see this presentation as well, since it um, links up with one of our other um, areas where we're doing a lot of work, and that's around integrated uh, data. So, uh, Lev, um, over to you, and we'll be uh, we'll be handing the presentation from our side. Cheers! Thank you very much for that. And um, oh, sorry. And so um, I was just so say when you just just tell us when you want to move to the next slide. Sure. Occasionally, there's a little bit of a delay. Just so you're aware. No worries. <laughs> I won't. I won't speak too quickly then. Um, thank you, and and welcome, um, everyone. What a great privilege um, it is here to present to all of you folks. Um, as Petra just sort of uh, mentioned, um, and Gemma sort of before, our team is literally located um, at the the mainland of Australia, so literally the other end um, of the world. 
And um, also, I just have to do a quick plug because we work very closely with Australian immigration and without their support um, for our work, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of this sort of this data um, linkage. So um, slide, please. So we know um, from our population census that we, we capture, um, you know, we, we, we collect a broad range of information about, you know, socioeconomic conditions of people, um, their geographic distribution at the time of the census, um, though, and cultural diversity. Um, and you can see, you know, just some stats here that I've pulled out of our population census about um, some of the, the diversity of Australia. Obviously, we're not as diverse as some, but we are more diverse than than others. Um, but one of the the, the key sort of uh, pieces of information that our census doesn't collect, which is particularly pertinent for measuring settlement of uh, refugee outcomes, is uh, information around migration characteristics. So things like the type of visa that they arrive on when they come to Australia, are they the main applicant or the secondary applicant? Did they apply onshore, offshore? Um, these, these kind of things. Um, then on the other side, we through a lot of sample surveys, we, we do collect, we do have visa modules where you can identify particular groups of migrants. But again, you're really beholden to the size of the, the sample in what you can do and the kind of information that you can elicit um, from that. Or if you want to do something at fine geographic level, sample doesn't always support that. Next slide, please. So to overcome this, um, this key information um, gap for refugee populations, um, again, with the help of Australian immigration, what we did was we, we spoke to them and we were able to facilitate um, with Gemma Van Heldren's help, actually, um, we were able to um, get hold of settlement records for all permanent migrants that arrived into Australia from 1st of January 2000 up until um, our population census, which was the 9th of August in, in 2016. And then what we did basically was we have to, we have the two data sets and then we, we link them or we sort of merge them together on similar information that exists on both data sets. So in terms of an immigration record, you know, we collect things like name, address, date of birth, sex, uh, country of, of origin, those kind of things. And similarly, we collect the same um, on the census. And then effectively, we try to merge, we do merge the two together based on those common variables to both data sets. Um, Managing statistical error is just a job <laughs> when you work with statistics, and I'm sure you're all familiar with. So the linkage process isn't 100% perfect, um, but it is pretty good. So we were able to uh, link about 88% of um, these settlement records with our population census. So it's about 1.9 million records out of about 2 million, 2.1 million that we were able to link. Um, and then obviously after this linkage process, we have some underrepresentation, so some very small groups um, that arrive to Australia and then effectively we, we weight um, or calibrate that data set so that's representative of the true population, which is our um, population of the sediment records that we uh, received. Um, so then basically at the end of that process, we end up with the Australian Census and Migrants Integrated data set. And um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to um, just mention from here on in. So the numbers that you see here, um, we we perturb this data. So it just sort of adjusts, makes minor adjustments to the data because we're not allowed to publish anything that um, you know could identify a particular individual. And particularly in the case of refugee populations, um, that's that's key. You know, we obviously want them to feel safe and to respond to surveys or the the census. So it's just a, an extra protection that we have to ensure the quality of our data. So just I just want to draw your attention to the left of the slide where we have um, that row that is highlighted in yellow, so the 195,000 odd. Um, so what you're looking at here is all of our permanent migrants that arrive during that particular reference period. So we have a humanitarian stream that the refugees sit um, under. So it's not like the highest level category. And then when we look to the right 
um, set of tables, you can see the three broad categories that we have. So we have humanitarian refugee, which is going to be sort of the focus of the data that's going to, um, I'll show you in a minute. And then we have the special humanitarian program as well, which is the largest chunk um, of humanitarians. Um, and ACMID also allows us, very importantly, to compare settlement outcomes, say, of refugees against uh, skilled migrants that enter um, Australia as well. So we can kind of we can do those direct comparisons between different migrant groups to see how they are settling. Next slide, please. So this is just really a, a, a very light. Um, touch of the type of information that we can get out of these data sets. So, for example, here we have our humanitarian refugees. We have two um, cohorts. We're looking at one that arrived more than five years from the time of our population census in 2016. And then we have another one that arrived within five years of our population census. So, um, Again, you can you can see just by virtue of numbers, obviously there's more that arrived a longer time ago than what there was um, just recently. Next slide, please. And we can also look at um, the English proficiency of the the refugee of people that come to Australia as refugees. So, obviously, acquisition of the host country. Um, across literature seems to be a major indicator of how well a um, of a refugee settles because obviously you know acquiring the host country's language helps to um, facilitate access to things like employment education these type of things and I guess from this graph it's not surprising to see that in the Australian context anyway people who have been here longer report um, higher numbers and pr uh, proportions are able to uh, speak English proficiency so they can get around in society they can work they they can do those kind of things next slide please again here we can look at the um the labor force status as well of people who are are refugees and um I should also add here, obviously, you know, time permitting, we can also have a look at the particular types of occupations that these people do. Um, we know in the Australian context, for example, some settlement programs um, try to offer incentives to move into particular industries, like it might be aged care, it might be civil construction, these type of things. So we can look and see, you know, over time, are they employed? Are they staying in the labour force? If they are employed, what type of occupations and which industries they're working in? Next slide, please. Um, also, by citizenship uh, status as well, we can see, you know, generally the longer hum uh, refugee uh, populations are in Australia, they become um, Australian citizens. And again, for us, that's that's we consider that to be another important um, marker of. Uh, settlement or integration into Australian society because when you're an Australian uh, citizen you can work in the public service you can stand um, in parliament and join the military and things like that whereas if you're not it, it precludes you from being able to um, access those type of fields so next slide please and the population is a little bit different. Um, I really wanted to show everyone this one because it's a little infograph that we put out um, every year when, you know, obviously when we get new data, we update it. But it shows that of all the permanent groups that come to Australia, um, the highest proportion of, of those are refugees, are humanitarians who become Australian citizens. And I'm sure within our own countries, you know, we, we do hear some of that rhetoric that says, you know, that, 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 that finds, you know, refugee groups sort of clustering together as problematic or um, those kind of things. Whereas this, you know, it clearly shows, you know, that they, they are becoming uh, citizens of, of Australia and are very keen and participating. Um, next slide, please. So we're also able through our population, through the strength of our uh, population census, sorry, um, able to produce very, granular levels, very fine levels of geographic information about these populations. So this um, is the next sort of geographic region down from Australia. So these are our major states. Um, and you can see the sort of the top three uh, states there um, is where refugees reported living at the time of our population census. And it's not surprising because in terms of our, um, 
I guess, a, a human geography of Australia. Those three uh, states are on the eastern side of Australia, which are the most populous uh, sides. And my home state, South Australia, is is fifth um, down there. So next slide, please. So again, we're just going even more granular uh, here as well. So we're looking again at my home state of South Australia, but we can also look at the countries of birth um, of people who arrived as uh, Australian citizens. And I mean, you can see here from, um, you know, just from the little graph that I've got that people born in Afghanistan, Syria and Pakistan predominantly arrived within the last five years of our population census. Whereas people from Bosnia, Herzegovina, they arrived much, much longer um, before the time of the population uh, census. So uh, I'm still within time. Um, so this is just a very, very broad um, brush sort of show of the kind of information that we've been able to um, elicit through data linkage um, as well. Um, I can provide those of you who are more technically minded about data linkage process um, for these particular projects. And I'm more than happy to sort of point you in the direction of that. Also, if you look at our website as well, we have a lot of free um, data that you can download in an Excel format from these data sets um, as well. And data integration for us is really opening up the possibilities about the type of information um, that we can get um, for refugee cohorts. So one thing we're, we're kind of we're looking at at the moment is through taxation data, having a longitudinal data set that can look at um, the employment outcomes and the, even the the incomes that refugee populations are earning over time um, as well. So um, thank you, everyone, and please, please keep safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that super interesting presentation. I think not just demonstrating the power of data integration, but it also shows how statistics are so important for dispelling myths around some of these more politically charged issues. Um, so what, what what happens with refugees and um, you know some of the uh, stories that we that might be less <laughs> evidence based. So you can use this evidence to dispel those myths. So I think that's a really powerful example as well. Um, so we now we'll go on to um, uh, Turkey, and we have uh, Dilik, and I always pronounce this wrong, Dilik Ilmaz, <laughs> and she's a statistician in the demographic statistics department of Turkstat. And Dilek and I have also worked together for a long time because Turkstat was one of the founding uh, institutions of the expert group on refugee and IDP statistics, and, and Dilek was one of the forces behind that. Um, she's participated in the studies on the 2000 population and housing census, establishment of address-based population registration system, and the 2011 uh, population and housing census. She specialises in international migration statistics and is responsible for the de determination of the farm population and production of annual migration flow statistics. So did I come over to you? Thank you, Petra. Uh, first, let me open my presentation. Uh, I'm sorry. I have a small technical problem. Would you like us to run it from our end? No, it's OK, I think. It's OK. Uh, thank you, Petra. Uh, can you see my presentation? Uh, not yet. Yes, OK. Uh, let me express my gratitude for Dilek, uh, Dilek, being... Sorry, Dilek, we don't see the presentation. You cannot see? No. Sorry. Uh, no. There is a problem. I cannot show it. I'm sorry. Okay, we can do it from our side. Um, Pim, do you have the presentation ready? Okay. Should I do it? Yeah, yeah, Thanks, yeah, Pim. I will. Thank you. It's open in the back, but I cannot uh, show. I'm sorry. Yeah, sometimes it happens. It seems can be a bit glitchy, but it's it's up now from Pim's side, so we can go ahead. And now I see. 
I see only half of the presentation now. No, we see the we see the I see the full screen. Really? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. OK. So I cannot see the presentation. OK. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now uh, I'll try to give uh, information on our official international migration statistics uh, with a special focus on uh, Syrians. Uh, please, next slide. Um, I will start uh, with uh, Turkey's official statistics okay. program, uh, move to the population registers, then uh, concept of foreigners in our population registers, I will speak a little about international migration variables, and if I will have enough time, I am planning to conclude my presentation with some uh, figures uh, from Turkey. Next slide, please. Uh, the main aim of the or of our official statistical program is to create a disciplined statistical production process by passing on to a disciplined statistical management with management. Uh, with the program, uh, standardization of the statistics is provided and clarified on which data will be compiled, by which institution, by which method, and for which period, and when it will be published. Uh, according to official statistical program, uh, under uh, international migration statistics, there are six subgroups. The first three, foreign population, statistics, immigration and emigration statistics, and statistics on Turkish citizens living abroad is under the re responsibility of Turkstat. Citizenship statistics is under the responsibility of Ministry of Interior, DG of civil registration and nationality, and statistics on residence permits, refugees, conditional refugees, subsidiary protection, temporary protection, and illegal migration is under the responsibility of Interior, uh, Ministry of Interior, DG of Migration Management. Uh, last but not the least, uh, work permit statistics is under the responsibility of Ministry of Family, Labor and Social Services. Next slide, please. And uh, we have our population registers, namely address-based population registration system. Uh, it was established in 2006. And since 2007, annual population statistics have been produced from this system. Uh, the system is also used as base for population projections, life tables, and also frame for household surveys. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, in the uh, in the population in our population register. Uh, we cover the fo foreign population uh, who are holding a valid residence and work permits as the reference day or uh, holding an identity document equivalent to residence and work permits or, uh, or the um, ex-Turkish citizens who have already renounced uh, its, their uh, citizenship and uh, already residing in the country. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, uh, I try to explain in detail who we cover, uh, who we do not cover, and why. Um, in summary, uh, we cover the refugees, um, conditional refugees, and individuals under subsidiary protection as the documents issued to these groups um, are substituting for residence permits. On the other hand, um, Syrians uh, who are under the um, uh, temporary protection uh, are not covered in the system because uh, the documents uh, given to this group do not uh, substitute uh, for residence permits. 
Uh, now uh, I would like to give uh, more uh, thumbs, some figures related to these um, groups. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Syrians are residing in Turkey uh, by two ways. Uh, the first group is uh, those uh, holding residence and work permits. And we cover uh, this group in the uh, official population. And those, uh, the second group is those under temporary protection. Uh, we do not cover uh, this group uh, in our official population. Um, according to ABPRS, um, our population register, as of 31st of December 2019, the size of the total population was 83 mi uh, million, almost or 83 million. Uh, 1.5 million of this group was foreigners. And within this group, uh, the size of the Syrians was only 114,000. At that time, um, according to the uh, statistics of DGMM, uh, the DG uh, of uh, Director General of Migration Management, uh, the size of the uh, Syrians under temporary protection was uh, 3. Point, almost 3.6 million. Uh, this means that uh, more than two times the total foreigners in ABPRS was uh, Syrians and uh, wasn't covered in our official population. And also uh, in the frame of household surveys, um, in the um, population projections and life tables. Next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, uh, I try to list the uh, in international migration variables. In the first uh, table, uh, uh, in this uh, variables in the first table are under the responsibility of Turkstat. I listed in uh, from traditional censuses and uh, statistics produced from ABPRS. And the second group, um, residence permits, as I mentioned before, uh, refugees, conditional refugees, subsidiary protection statistics, temporary protection, and illegal migration statistics, work permit statistics are under the responsibility of other institutes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 Maybe uh, I can uh, add something about um, Egris. Um, and as a result of the open border policy of the country uh, to the Syria crisis, uh, we became the biggest refugee taking country in 2014. Um, and unfortunately, we are still keeping our position. Um, as a country taking the largest number of refugees, uh, it was an honor for us uh, to host the first meeting of IGRIS in 2015 in Antalya. Um, as uh, Vibeke uh, mentioned uh, in her presentation, uh, we are a member of IGRIS. And uh, we are happy uh, to uh, to um, uh, participate, uh, and uh, we are trying to contribute uh, to the, its uh, studies as much as uh, possible. And we are also benefiting the outputs of uh, EGRIS. And uh, I guess my time is running out. Uh, I put some international migration statistics uh, from my country. Uh, maybe I will not have enough time uh, to explain, but just in the first uh, slide, uh, I put the uh, numbers of foreigners and total population uh, from 2007. And the next slide, please. In the next slide, um, uh, I put the migration flow statistics. Uh, we have only uh, four periods. Um, uh, for migration flows. And next slide, please. And this, uh, I prepared this slide uh, from the, uh, the GMM's uh, website. Uh, I put the uh, uh, international migration, uh, international protection applications, uh, residence permit statistics, and uh, Syrian refugees uh, by the years. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to. Uh, I'm happy uh, to. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Dilek. Um, and that was a very, very interesting presentation. I think for me, it's always, it's always striking just the numbers in terms of Syrians. There are more than 3.6 million um, Syrian refugees, and it really is very commendable that Turkey um, is is uh, bearing such a hosting so many uh, refugees as well as many others from other countries as well. Um, uh, so finally, we'll go to UNHCR and we have Alessandro Tello, who is the Data Identity Management and Analysis, the DEMA Senior Coordinator of the UNHCR Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. Um, Alessandro has been at UH, UNHCR a long time. He started in 2004 with the implementation of Project Profile in CAD, and he's got extensive experience working on and supporting registration in several emergency operations in Africa, the Americas, Asia and the Middle East. He's also previously been the focal point for registration field support and a key resource for issues on IDP uh, registration. Uh, so Alessandro, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Petra, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can you see my uh, my screen? Can yes, you see, the... see it well. Yeah. Okay. I will be really short and I really look forward to to our conversation. I will just give a um, quick overview of the refugee uh, population uh, in our region and uh, which is the which are the refugee statistics sources and how we really would like to uh, uh, get positive advantages by the recently released uh, uh, um, recommendations both iris and uh, irs from the group of experts uh, so um, as you know in the recent years uh, the number of uh, forcibly displaced people is increased significantly all around the world in our region that uh, Mm, does not cover geographically all the ESCAP countries and uh, we don't include, uh, for example, the 3.9 million of uh, uh, refugee and asylum seekers of Turkey. We cover, um, we have 9.4 million persons of concern, specifically 4.4 million refugees and 3.1 million uh, internally displaced persons. So uh, in the last five years, from 2004 uh, teen until uh, 2019 uh, and mid-year 2020, we had an increase also in the region, 6% increase of refugees and asylum seekers and 14% increase over the last five, five years of uh, internal displaced persons in the region. Now, uh, again, just to uh, let you know that we don't cover uh, the entire geographical ESCAP region, but the top seven uh, countries, uh, hosting countries of refugee and asylum seeker in the region are Pakistan with 1.4 million, mostly Afghan uh, POR registered card holders, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran with approximately 980,000, and Bangladesh with 855,000 approximately, while the uh, top five uh, IDPs countries are uh, Afghanistan with 2.5 million, followed by Myanmar and the Philippines. Now, when uh, we uh, report uh, and we will look uh, right now at sources on uh, IDP's figures, uh, UNHCR only um, refers to um, uh, conflict-induced IDPs and those protect Pro protected and assisted by UNHCR. So if we want to have a, uh, a complete overview of the IDP uh, figures and statistics, we can refer to the IDMC uh, website because we report only on a specific uh, a part of the IDP population. Um, now, uh, in the um, region, uh, most of the countries uh, are um, the registration authorities, the governments and the state is the primary uh, 
uh, as the primary responsibility for uh, refugee and asylum seeker uh, registration. Um, when uh, governments uh, don't do or ask for support, UNHCR provide a technical support and we can register on behalf of the government. So uh, we may have uh, different uh, kind of registration. We have uh, government registration when go uh, authorities do it directly um, and assume their responsibilities in doing so. Uh, when they ask UNHCR uh, to do so, so we have UNHCR registration. In certain countries, we do it jointly with the government, while in other countries, um, we have split registration, meaning that government register uh, a specific caseload while UNHCR register another caseload. And uh, in the region out of the 4.4 uh, million refugees, we only have 30% um, of uh, refugees and asylum seekers that are registered with the UNHCR systems, meaning that the 70%, the majority are registered in government system, and sometimes we do not have uh, access to this data. Now, one challenge that we, uh, uh, we may face is that often uh, the registration authority within the government is, as we have seen from previous uh, um, uh, presentation in Australia and Turkey, uh, often this authority sits in uh, different departments of, uh, than NSOs, so uh, Ministry of Home Affairs or Immigration Departments, and when uh, there are uh, uh, except the good practices that we just saw and we hope they will be replicated um, in uh, several countries in the region from now on, uh, often uh, refugees uh, are not um, are not uh, included in national in national uh, censuses or in uh, national household service that um, uh, national statistical offices uh, lead and run. Um, I will just briefly mention that uh, the reporting and the source on IDP figures is completely different from the refugee one. Uh, usually IDP figures are uh, uh, interagency uh, agreed figures in the country, um, meaning by um, different uh, NGOs, UN and non-UN actors, and again they get cleared by uh, the government at provincial or at central level, depending on the operational context. Now, um, as I mentioned, both, uh, both uh, uh, the IR, uh, IRRS, uh, uh, the International Recommendation on Refugee Statistics, and the International Recommendation on uh, IDPs, uh, statistics are uh, uh, pretty much uh, recent. Uh, they are really extremely timely uh, because um, um, of this uh, huge increase in the past recent years in the refugee uh, uh, and the forced displacement uh, population, including in uh, the Asia and the Pacific. And um, we really want to use the uh, recommendation as a tool uh, and to see how we can operationalize them at the regional level to ensure a regional um, coherent approach and uh, to make sure that, um, as Lev just showed us, we can compare easily through the inclusion of refugees in national censuses or national household level surveys, uh, data between national population and other kind of population, in this case, refugees, um, and uh, have a clear picture, socioeconomic profile of these minorities that often are the most vulnerable one. Um, I will stop there and uh, I um, open, uh, I, I, I give back the floor to you, Petra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, and now we can uh, open the floor to questions, but I will start it off with a question that we received in advance. Um, and it came from uh, Mr. Mohammed al Magir Hossein of the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. Um, and probably, Alessandro, you'll be best placed to answer this one. And the question is, what is the definition of a refugee-like population? So there is a category called refugee-like, 
and he's asking what is that definition and he's asking will the Rohingya population be considered as refugees as Bangladesh has not given them refugee status? Okay, uh, really, really good question and thank you uh, for that. Uh, now, um, refugee like uh, uh, refers to a category refers to a category which is um, uh, which is descriptive in nature, right? So it includes uh, uh, all those group of population that face uh, that are outside of the country of origin and that face the uh, risk similar to the one the protection risk similar to the one that refugees um, have but that they don't have a, a certain yet their refugee status. So um, in, um, in general, when we use this category, and if I'm not wrong uh, in the region, we only use it in Thailand, the refugee-like definition, um, it, uh, in, it falls under the uh, larger group of refugees. So when we give the 4.4 the million refugee figures, this includes both refugee uh, and uh, refugee-like uh, categories uh, and definitions. And specifically on Bangladesh, um, uh, it's uh, 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 true the government did not recognize them. They called them, the government of Bangladesh called the Rohingya population has uh, forcibly displaced the Myanmar nationals. Uh, however, the government also um, agreed uh, that um, we can report uh, uh, this uh, specific Rohingya population as refugee under temporary protection, which is exactly the uh, same example that uh, Dilek was giving for the Syrians in Turkey uh, and uh, the uh, definition of temporary refugee temporary protection is because um, mm, the government has granted that their stay in the host country. Uh, so I guess I hope I answered to that specific question, but I'm available for any further clarification as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, Dilek, would you like to perhaps also comment, given the situation of temporary protection of the Turkey of the Syrian refugees in uh, Turkey, and whether I know that UNHCR and those people report them as refugees. What what would you like to add anything on that? Um, in Turkey, we have uh, geographical restrictions. And uh, we do not uh, accept um, the uh, population as a refugee uh, coming from the east east side of the country. Uh, so uh, this um, Syrian group is not accepted as a refugee in my country, and um, they have um, uh, also they uh, come to the country uh, with the, uh, high, uh, with the big groups, you know. So um, accepted as um, um, uh, temporary protection, and uh, they have their own uh, regulation and uh, different from uh, refugees totally. Okay. And uh, also, since they have been uh, in the country um, almost um, soon, it will be 10 years, they are still uh, under temporary protection and uh, the, they don't have the rights to stay um, I mean, uh, they are not temporary, um, they are not um, uh, residents, um, uh, they don't have uh, the right to reside in the country. One day, um, uh, the, um, one day uh, with a law, uh, it will be uh, expired. Thanks, um, thanks, Dilek. I think this highlights perhaps some of the issues with the statistics at the international level and then at the national level and some of the discrepancies which um, can sometimes um, exist in how these populations are, are reported. Um, 
I think we can go to the next question. Um, and I'd also invite um, maybe Becca and Lev if uh, you have anything to add to this next question, which came from um, a colleague from Nepal who I think has actually just left the, the meeting. But the question was, are there any recommendations on counting refugees? And he highlighted it inside camp, but I, I assume this would also apply outside of camps in population and housing censuses. Um, Rebecca, would you like to perhaps, you know, based on your knowledge of the, of the IRS and the census recommendations, would you want to answer that one? I think, the, and I think in a sense, you probably are, are just as good as responding to this as I am, Petra, since I have been focusing more on the IDP document than, than the refugee one. But overall, um, I think uh, it's very clearly recommended in, in the IRRS uh, to include refugees uh, in the population and housing censuses. And there's some quite clear guidance uh, on, on how to do it and, and what questions to ask, etc. And I see Alessandra has already put some of that in, in the chat. So yeah, maybe you also want to add to it, Alessandra. Uh, no, the big, uh, uh, nothing to add. I was just mentioning a bit the the um, specific uh, chapter if, if it's easier to find that. And uh, uh, we are willing to support uh, the NSO of Nepal. I understand there is a census uh, go starting next year, 2021. Uh, so, if they need any support in uh, uh, including a refugee question, if still possible, uh, we are ready to, to assist. Thank you. Um, Dilek and uh, Lev, would you like to add anything from, the, from your country experiences on including refugees in censuses? We, um, from the Australian perspective anyway, we, 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 we count you <laughs> no matter where you are. Um, if you're if you're in a prison or in a uh, in a hospital and you're not able to um, directly participate, like you you will get counted. So someone will take administrative data and then we will we will add that into um, into our census. So for us, for us it's 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 kind of the opposite problem. We we know that refugee um, people that arrive to Australia as refugees are in our general population. It's more about how do we how do we identify them and their particular socioeconomic um, conditions and whatnot, hence um, data linkage. And uh, Dilek, would you like to add anything? Um, we, um, in 2021, uh, we will um, apply a fully, fully register-based census and we will use the registers only. We will not go to fields. Um, uh, we don't currently we don't have the registers of um, uh, Syrians under temporary protection, but uh, the register uh, these registers are kept by DGMM and they have uh, good registers. I I think um, maybe we can uh, get together old registers. But uh, I'm not sure uh, if they have uh, all uh, information, I mean, education or um, occupation, uh, disability uh, information of the, uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, if DGMM have uh, this uh, information. Um, maybe um, they can reproduce um, statistics um, by DJMM can produce statistics and we can produce statistics uh, without uh, Syrians. Uh, it's it's not decided yet. But all other groups, I mean, uh, refugees. Asylums. Uh, we covered uh, this group in the population, so uh, we have their information. Okay, thank you. And I mean, I'm uh, the moderator, not a panelist, but I hope it's okay just to add from uh, my experience with the, the recommendations. And that's that um, the 2020 um, census round recommendations, the principles and recommendations say that refugees in uh, living in camps should be enumerated and listed separately, um, but does not make any recommendations regarding refugees um, outside of 
camps, although they would be enumerated as part of the de facto uh, population. Um, within, as uh, has been put into the um, chat box with the links, with the expert group and the recommendations which came out, there are now more recommendations around including questions which would allow refugees to be identified as well, including those who are living outside of, uh, of camps. And I can see that uh, Kwesi has a colleague and who works in, um, in, in Kenya. He's put in the, the Kenyan example from their 2019 census, which is a very good example of attempting to identify refugees um, within the census. Um, so uh, with that, um, we've actually come to the end of our hour. It's gone by extremely quickly. Um, I would like to, to close and to thank our panelists, Alessandro, Dilek, Vibeka, and Lev for these fantastic presentations, for giving up your time um, to participate. I'd like to thank all the participants who asked questions. Um, the presentations and the recording will be made um, available to you. Um, so it'll all be online if you want to look over anything. And this chat function will be available, I think, for another month. So if anyone thinks of any questions, you can ask it here and we will be able to access it and answer any questions. So with that, uh, thank you all and um, say goodbye to our next Stats Cafe next week, which is going to be on rapid mortality surveillance. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you goodbye. very much. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye.